We're about to enter a holy place, you know. It's the birth of the internet, and we're going to take you back more than 50 years. So it's right down the hall here. I'm at the UCLA Samueli School of Engineering with computer science professor Len Kleinrock. It's really quiet this afternoon as we walk down an empty hallway because students are taking their final exams. He's bringing me to room 3420, a very famous site in the history of the internet. And I have to say, I'm getting excited. And again, you have to get in the mood to enter this room. Now you have to imagine, you're going back to 1969. The color, the lights, the floor, come on in. As I walk into the room, it's like I just stepped back in time. There are formulas scribbled in chalk on a blackboard and a tall gray metal box placed in the corner on a low platform. We're looking at the first installed piece of ARPANET equipment ever. It's called an Interface Message Processor, or an IMP for short. It's the equivalent of what we now call a router. It's the hardware that would make it possible for one computer to talk to another. It's a military hardened machine. It's a lot taller than I thought it would be. Yeah, it's the size of a telephone booth or a refrigerator. Yeah, it's like the size of a taller, even taller than a refrigerator. It almost looks like a water boiler, but it has a thick military hardened cover. It's rumored it was built to withstand a nuclear bomb. That's never been tested, of course. There's a metal plate on the front that says Interface Message Processor in all capital letters in between two rows of switches and lights. But it's a mini computer, state of the art in 1968. This is, notice, imp number one. There it is, imp number one. Oh, that's very exciting. And using this imp, this machine, Professor Len Kleinrock and his team of graduate students at UCLA did something that had never been done before. The inside is so ugly. (laughs) It's beautiful. beautiful. Don't you just have to love that machine? Len describes the amp like a vintage car he restored. He even had me smell it. And I'm going to give you a treat that most people don't get. Okay. And that is if you smell, you smell the machine of that period. It's got a unique odor. It does smell kind of metallic, but... Metallic, sort of uh, rancid, old, rotting equipment, but it's not yet rotting. Yes. Len is a guy, if you met at a cocktail party, you could find yourself talking to him for hours. He's a lovely mix of showman and nerd. He's 89, but you'd never know it. He's slender, suntanned, with a full head of slightly graying curly hair and a thick New York accent. On the day we meet, he's dressed in a crisp yellow dress shirt and a navy blazer. And fun fact, Well, more strange than fun, he used to live four doors down in Brentwood from O.J. Simpson. But I'm here because he is one of the first people my dad said I should try and find to tell me about the history of the ARPANET. He has, after all, been called by many people, especially himself, a founding father of the Internet, in part for the work he did with that first imp at UCLA, which he thinks doesn't get enough credit. When you go to LAX, Los Angeles Airport, and you come in, there's a big sign there that said, Welcome to Los Angeles, home of the 1984 Olympics. No, it should say, Los Angeles, birthplace of the internet. But there are plenty of people who have called Len out for taking this too far, in particular for exaggerating the significance of his role in the birth of the internet. There is even one man who spent his final days literally on his deathbed, crusading against Len. So what really happened at UCLA back in 1969? Was it the start of the internet? And what place in history does Len actually deserve? This is Computer Freaks from Inc. Magazine. I'm Christine Hani Dare Bryan. Chapter Two In the Air. (music) 
Let's start with why UCLA in the first place. So the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, wanted to make JCR Licklider's intergalactic network a reality. Lick's vision, which you heard about in episode one, was carried on by brilliant minds like his mentee Bob Taylor, who managed the project, and Larry Roberts, who designed the network that would span the country. So they had the vision, the funding, and the design for the ARPANET. Now they needed someone to build it. So ARPA sent out a request for proposal in 1968. And the company that won that was Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, or BBN, is where Lick worked when he came up with his idea of man-computer symbiosis. The contract was to build a node network. Each one was specified. UCLA was to be the first one. And we were supposed to come up in September, over the Labor Day weekend of 1969. Eight months. What a challenge for a company to take a te- new technology, new users, new applications, a new machine, and deploy it and get it up and running in eight months. And they did it. BBN, God bless them. They did a magnificent job. They brought it on time, on budget, running. That could never happen today. That could never happen today. They started by delivering four imps to four sites, or nodes as they're called in the industry. And over Labor Day weekend, 1969, Len Kleinrock was lucky enough to receive the very first one. He and Larry Roberts at ARPA had been classmates at MIT and worked together. Kleinrock said Larry knew how much detailed analysis he had done on computer networks, giving him the inside track to get UCLA that first imp. And so we received our first mini computer. We called it an IMP, an interface message processor. And the Tuesday after the Monday of Labor Day, we had it up and running. So imp number one and node number one is ready to go but it takes two to tango. One node does not a network make. He had to wait for the second node. And by schedule, the second node came in in October of 1969. Stanford Research Institute, 350 miles to the north, got their imp, and a high-speed line was connected between those two imps. And now we had two nodes. Two nodes or two sites meant they could try to make the two imps talk to each other, one at UCLA and one at Stanford Research Institute, SRI, in Silicon Valley. And so, on October 29, 1969, around 10 o'clock at night, a couple of grad students started to experiment with those two imps. I happened to be in my office at the time, by the way. I worked very late. A lot of the students did. I often worked late. I had been known to stay overnight (laughs) in the computer room if I was working on something and it wasn't working and might stay overnight and go to my 8 a.m. class the next day. That's Charlie Klein, Len's student who was manning the computer at UCLA that night. Klein was only 21 years old at the time. He worked as a graduate student researcher in Klein Rock's lab. It was how he paid the bills. He was just a student trying to make extra money and his task on this night was to test these two nodes. So Charlie was in room 3420 at UCLA, the same room Len Kleinrock showed me. And Charlie's on the phone with Bill Duvall, who was manning the second imp at Stanford Research Institute. And we were talking over the telephone, and we sort of went through the little magic that we had to go through to think we connected the two computers. And so Bill Duvall at SRI wrote the software at his end to do that, and I wrote the software at our end so that I could take whatever I typed and it would send it through the imp to the imp at SRI, where it would then go send into the SRI 940, which would process it and send back whatever responses it was supposed to send back. They didn't realize that this test might go down in history. They didn't even know if what they were doing was going to work. This was just a routine test of a new program. If you want to actually run any programs or do anything useful, you had to log in, which you did by actually typing the word login. So the idea was just to log in. So we're going to basically send the first message ever on this two-node network, which is going to become the internet eventually. We didn't realize that at the time. 
Len Kleinrock, despite all his showman tendencies, missed this opportunity for fanfare. Okay, so we should have a good message, right? And a camera, and a voice recorder, and a record of some sort. No, we didn't have a camera, we didn't have a voice recorder, and we certainly did not prepare a good message. I mean, look at this, Samuel Morse, a first telegraph message, we all know it. What hath God wrought? Powerful, prophetic, religious message. Bell telephone, okay, Alexander Graham Bell. Come here, Watson, I need you. Neil Armstrong, a giant leap for mankind. Those guys were smart. They understood media and public relations and the press. We were just a couple of nerds. So all we wanted to do was log in. So the goal was to type out login, L-O-G-I-N, one letter at a time, from Charlie's computer at UCLA to Bill's at SRI. So Charlie's sitting there. And he types the L. And he says to Bill, you get the L? The character went down to the other computer, and the other computer looked at it and said, oh, they just typed an L, so they sent an L back. And, uh, you know, the fact that the L got, got across, we both sort of went, wow. The L made it over to SRI. So Charlie continued the test. I typed the O for the next letter of login. Same thing with an O, typed an O, okay, they got typed an O, they said an O back. Type the G, and he got the G, and he says, I got the G. Crash. The network crashed. There was a lot more going on in the world at that time, in 1969, besides a network crashing. In July, there was the first moon landing. In August, there was Woodstock. Plus, people were still reeling from the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy. And anger toward the government's role in Vietnam was growing day by day. This was the era of Vietnam, and so if you were young, it was certainly, you know, you were very aware of what was going on there, and it it wasn't good. Students like Bill and Charlie had friends fighting in Vietnam. They themselves were at risk of being drafted. That was a terrible time. I mean, that was a terror for my generation. In the beginning, it was just if you were of the, of the wrong age, you'd be drafted and, and guess where you're going is Vietnam. And then they went to the lottery system. And if you had a little lottery number, you were SLL. That was probably the biggest single thing in their lives. By the fall of 1969, Nixon had promised that he would be well on his way to pulling troops out of Vietnam and Americans were fed up. The change to the draft lottery system that Duval mentioned, which made any men eligible between the ages of 18 and 25, only added fuel to the spire. By then, college campuses were ablaze in protest, both to end the war and to protest any academic collaboration with the government. In many protesters' eyes, there was little difference between working on a DOD-funded project like the ARPANET and supporting the Vietnam War. At Stanford, mass student demonstrations were forcing SRI to cut ties with the university altogether. On the East Coast, just one month before Charlie and Bill tried to send that login message, dozens of students invaded a campus building at Harvard in protest of ARPA-related research. They threw rocks through windows and spray-painted slogans on the walls like PEG and fuck U.S. imperialism. During that same era, Down the road from Harvard at BBN, where those first imps were built, anti-war protesters showed up at their doorstep. When we heard that they were coming, me and two or three other people huddled in a conference room. That's Bernie Cassell, who was working for BBN on that ARPANET contract. And decided that we were going to greet them because they were mistaken. They thought that BBN were evil government contractors and they were prolonging the war and doing nasty things. He felt like these protesters had it all wrong. Just because the project was DOD-sponsored didn't mean that this ARPANET thing was being used to help the war. And so we had whipped up a welcome to BBN uh, little memo and printed it all out. And basically they came marching up uh, Moulton Street looking for a fight. And we came out And a bunch of small bunch of us came out, welcomed them, handed out papers, our little memos and stuff, engaged with them to tell them about what we were doing at BBN and why we weren't evil government contractors and stuff like that, and 
sort of the cherry on the cake was that one of the executive VPs basically saw what we were doing and what he did was invited all the protesters to come up onto the lawn in front of BBN. And since he invited them, they weren't trespassing. And since they weren't blocking the street, the police couldn't do anything. So the whole thing turned out to be a complete, peaceful, interactive thing. And then they discovered they were having no fun trying to protest at BBN. And so they just quietly walked back and the whole thing was completely defused. There was an irony to the whole situation. These grad students felt pressure from their peers to deny DOD projects. But at the same time, working on the ARPANET meant they could find their way around the draft and didn't have to fight in the war. I had some trouble due to the Vietnam War at that time with being at MIT, and my draft board threatened to draft me. So I basically had to withdraw from MIT. And surprisingly enough, Due to my work at BVN, I actually got an occupational deferment. So as long as I kept working at BVN, I was secure from not being drafted. Had I gone to Vietnam, I'd have been dead in 10 minutes. I mean, I'm the, I'm the kind of idiot who sticks his head up at the wrong time. The last voice you heard was Bob Metcalf. He would go on to invent the Ethernet. You probably know Ethernet from those cables that get tangled in your drawers but it is the technology that underpins the Wi-Fi we use every day. In the fall of 69, he was a grad student working on an ARPA contract at Harvard, funded by the DOD. And the D was to emphasize that those dollars were to be spent on defense matters, not on uh, open-ended computer research. And then those of us who worked for the Department of Defense had to defend ourselves against the hippies who were against the war. And we said our, our money was only bloody on one side. <laughs> that was the expression. Every dollar spent at ARPA was not a dollar spent on uh, killing Vietnamese. In the first episode of this series, we talked about this uneasy partnership academics had with the government, how they had to separate and rationalize their anti-war sentiment with working on DOD projects. And it's not like the military guys were all that supportive of the ARPANET researchers either. It reminds me of my dad, wanting to get these computer freaks off the network. Actually, Metcalf had a story about some trouble he and a friend got into on the military base where I was born. Well, that's where we were thrown out of the officers club. We were, <laughs> we were not properly dressed. We had blue jeans and big beards. And, no, I was not a hippie, but I did have a beard, a huge red Viking beard. And we tried to get into the officers club at Tinker Air Force Base during the Vietnam War, I might add. <laughs> Even working on a military project doesn't make you one of them. The gap in worldview of the military guys we ran into and us was huge. It was a, an uncrossable canyon. We used different languages. And there's this war going on, and war is a very serious thing. And uh, war is hell. Thousands were dying in Vietnam. And academics were back in their labs, safe, writing code. It's understandable that this line was drawn. Military and everyone else. And the truth is, this technology wasn't much use for the war anyway. In late 1969, all the early users of the ARPANET could do was type the letters for login. Or actually, back in Len Kleinrock's lab that October night, only the LO had made it from UCLA to Stanford. So, what was the first message ever on the internet? Low, as in, lo and behold. I added that later. (laughs) But imagine that message, although we didn't prepare it, is the most prophetic, most succinct, most powerful message we could have imagined. The first message ever on the internet was low. And with that, according to Len, the internet was born. There's no debate that this moment is a significant one in computer science history. But three decades after that night in 1969, Len may have gotten a little carried away with himself. 
he published a web page in the late 1990s calling himself the inventor of the internet technology. And this is where Len's story takes a turn. Len's declaration was extremely polarizing in the community of networking founders. But no one was more angry than a Welsh physicist who on his deathbed in 2000 was cursing the name Len Kleinrock. Computer Freaks is brought to you by Inc. Business Media. Inc. is here to support the American entrepreneur through its journalism, recognition programs like the Inc. 5000, live events like Inc. Founders House, and small peer-to-peer networking. We aim to inform, educate, and elevate the profile of our community, the risk takers, the innovators, and the ultra-driven go-getters who create our future. For more essential journalism like Computer Freaks, go to Inc.com and subscribe to Inc. Unlimited to experience the full offering of writing, video, and podcasts. Donald Davies was a renowned Welsh physicist who in his final days talked to Katie Hafner, my former colleague from The New York Times. Donald Davies was a researcher in the UK who actually came up with the word packet in packet switching. Packet switching is the core technology that lets messages be broken up into many parts so that they can be sent most efficiently across networks. And it's the technological theory that Len Kleinrock's team at UCLA used to send the login message. But it wasn't Len who invented packet switching. So Davies had come up with it. He worked on it very quietly through the 60s. And then he saw at the end of his life that other people were taking credit for it. And he, on his deathbed, actually got angry. He didn't get angry until, or at least publicly, he didn't get publicly angry until he was dying. And he wrote a paper. And the paper was published posthumously after he died. And it basically was an attack on Len Kleinrock. The paper he wrote was called A Historical Study of the Beginnings of Packet Switching. It was published in January of 2001. The paper laid out exactly what three major players in the early foundations of the ARPANET should be credited for contributing. In the paper, Donald Davies was criticizing Kleinrock for not actually doing the work on packet switching that he claimed to have done. And that Kleinrock was a queuing theorist. And uh, what Davies said was that Kleinrock had not taken his queuing theory beyond one node. And the thing to remember about the ARPANET is that one node, there's nothing to communicate with. It needed a second node. The ARPANET didn't actually exist until the second node at SRI existed. And then they had a network. And that's what Davies was saying, was that Kleinrock was describing communications, but it was communications within a single node. And I think that really, um, I think that really, if anything set off this debate about who deserves what credit, it was Davies' final blow right before his death that really set things on fire. And it's ironic that it came from the humblest of the bunch. In this paper, Davies said that the work of Kleinrock gives him no claim to have originated packet switching. In fact, he said that the honor should really go to another computer scientist named Paul Barron. You see, Davies invented the word packet, 
But Paul Barron may have been the first to come up with the concept of packet switching. Of all the internet pioneers, or we should call them ARPANET pioneers, really, Paul was the menchiest of the group. Just the nicest guy. Barron was designing a packet switch network that would make communications less vulnerable in the event of a nuclear attack. He published this in the 60s as a series of technical papers, many of which were classified, a few of which were not. And that was that. So he was doing this work in parallel with what Donald Davies was doing in the UK on packet switching as well. Katie wrote about the moment these two scientists learned of each other's work in her book, Where Wizards Stay Up Late. Three years before Kleinrock's login message, in the spring of 1966, Davies presented a public lecture in London where he talked about the concept of sending packets through a network. At the end of the session, a man from the British Ministry of Defense approached him and let him know that another researcher in the U.S., named Paul Barron, was doing similar work for the U.S. defense community. It's the phenomenon of the simultaneity of invention, kind of the time is ripe phenomenon, where everything is in the air. It happened with the structure of DNA, and it's happened with many just scientific discoveries and technical breakthroughs, um, is that the time is, is ripe for this thing to happen, and it happened to be the case with packet switching. There were at least two other men working on packet switching at the same time, if not earlier than Len Kleinrock. So Davies got upset that Len was taking credit for both his work and the work of Paul Barron. We have these baser impulses because we're all human and we see others getting rich and we wonder why we are not as rich as they are. We see others getting the limelight and we feel envy. We're, unless we're saints, we're all prone to that. And, you know, this is why God invented the seven deadly sins. This is one of them. Len's human impulse to write his own legacy and call himself the inventor of the internet technology rubbed many of the founding fathers the wrong way. It's an ugly story, and it's inexplicable. Here's Kleinrock, a god, but it's it, not enough for him. Bob Metcalf, one of the former MIT grad students you heard from earlier, says even people who like Len think he's taking this too far. He's overreaching now. Now he's letting people give him credit for inventing the internet. Now that Donald Davies and uh, Paul Barron have died, Kleinrock is grabbing all the credit he can, and it's really ugly. I'm a big fan of Lenin Kleinrock, but I, he has this little thing that he, he needs to be more famous. Up until Len's claims, the whole ARPANET project had really been a team effort. If you had asked around the ARPANET project in 1970, 1971, who was responsible for Invention X? The answer you would have uniformly gotten from just about everybody was a collaborative project. Everybody was influencing everybody else. And it was impossible to answer questions about X unless X was very narrow. That's John Clenson, who worked on internet technology at MIT in the 60s and 70s. Clenson has had a bone to pick with Len since shortly after J.C.R. Licklider died. Once things took off in a major way and Lick had passed away, Kleinrock started claiming that the answer to, I will exaggerate only slightly, the answer to all possible questions about who is responsible for X was Len Kleinrock. Len has certainly made a big deal of the work he did at UCLA. I can understand why he would want to build up his university and make sure it received proper credit for its contributions. There was also an East Coast, West Coast split, and this is all on the ARPANET side between who was responsible for what, because the folks at BBN who had written the proposal to do the core work and the folks at MIT who had been working with them felt that they had made some major contributions to both the design and the implementation. And the folks at UCLA, and to a lesser extent the folks at Utah, believed or claimed that everything important had happened there. 
Remember the sign Len wanted to put up at LAX that said, birthplace of the internet? I admire him for not surrendering all credit to the arrogant East Coast academic institutions who turned their noses up at California and ultimately would not make much of an effort to memorialize any of this history. Klein Rock has made the claim that it was all his idea. Not only UCLA was important, but it was his idea from the beginning, and the whole idea grew out of his PhD dissertation. That happened when we made the shift to this ARPANET internet thing is really very important, and who's responsible? Me, 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 me. I think Klein Rock has made some very, very significant contributions, and nobody should deny that. But I think his claims to be the inventor of almost everything. Yeah. No, I definitely got on a plane and went to Klein Rock's office and asked him, because you're not the only person saying that. And I was very upfront with him. I was like, people who are very fond of you are saying you're overstretching. Good. I'm glad you've gotten that message from multiple directions. I spent a lot of time being a low voice in the wilderness, and I don't enjoy it. As I said to Clemson, I did push Len on these allegations that he took too much credit. I wasn't just at UCLA to hear the lo and behold story or smell the first imp. I needed to get Len's side of the story. Here is my conversation with him about all of this. Um, I want to spend some time talking about credit. So I know um, when I first started talking to my father about this project, I said, you know, juggling my dad's health, juggling making dinner, juggling my kids running around. I, really, I said, who are like the four people in the history of this project that I need to talk to? And he said, Vint Cerf, Bob Kahn, Jake Feinler, because he worked with her directly, and you. So I appreciate and recognize your role in this history. What I want to make sure I'm completely clear about are two things. Packet network and to what extent, it it sounds like there's been some dispute about whether you created the packet network, whether Paul Barron should be credited for this. What is your take on that? Okay. First, first, answer the first question. Four people. N people. Well, just four people in my father's life. Yeah. I understand. But but that's a general feeling. We honor... We give medals, we give prizes to some of the pioneers. I contend that if none of those pioneers had been born, we would still have the internet today. Maybe slightly different. It was going to happen. The vision was there. It was in the air. We happened to be lucky to be there just when the technology was capable of doing this. That's the answer to your first question. We got into packet stuff. My work started in 1959 at MIT, and it culminated in 1962. And I was interested, as I said, in the mathematical modeling of a network. How do you model a network which would do in dynamic resource sharing? And dynamic resource sharing is the underlying principle. How do you allocate this thing dynamically? There are many ways to do it. One way is called message switching. Another way is called packet switching. Another way is called asynchronous time division multiplexing. Another way is called polling. I'm mentioning those not to confuse you, but there are many ways to dynamically assign a resource on demand. I was looking at message switching, but in the process, as my modeling, in the process, I recognized uh, that queuing theory was important. And I said, well, how do you manage the queue? Because one of the important aspects of network, and in packet switching in particular, is to make sure that a small message doesn't get behind a long one. But to kind of consolidate it to make sure I'm, for the purposes of our audience, that they're really hearing, Ah, how do you feel about any accusations that you took undue credit for Paul Barron's work or anything like that? I never took credit for Paul Barron's work. I've given him credit for the architectural side. He looked at the end-to-end. I looked at the single node but I was the first to analyze the way a node would behave using packet switching. And I published that in April of 62. Okay. I give Paul all the credit for basically the architectural side and independently, we were unaware of each other's work until 
all our work was published, basically. And he came up with the idea of packet switching. I came up with the idea of message switching with packetizing having an advantage if you do that on a single node. And I point out, and I can show you in the book, that I said that should be extended to the other node. But I never described the architecture of end-to-end -end behavior. Len was, was already was getting frustrated with my line of questioning, but I had to ask him about Donald right. Davies as well. Okay, Donald came into the picture later. Donald came in in the 65, 66, after my work and Paul's work were already published. He did make a single node packet switch before ARPA did, by the way. And the UK government decided not to allow him to build multi-node networks, so that was a shame. But he, uh, he and I had an exchange before he passed away, an extended email into exchange, talking about what I had done and what he had done. And in fact, he admits he had read my book when he was looking at his own work and using some of the technology. And the only equation he has in one of his key papers is an equation directly out of my book, as an example. He, he puts himself in my mind and says, how could I have been thinking about packetizing messages? Well, I was. He imagined I wasn't. He was trying to imagine what I was thinking. And I challenged, you know, I know what I was thinking, and he can only, he can't guess what I was thinking. So he was, I think, unhappy that the UK never allowed him to build a multi-node network. And he lashed out in a very ugly way. I have a long response to that, which I've never published, because I don't want to basically uh, go, you know, bang, bang, the man has passed away. But his paper was, uh, and he, notice he wrote it posthumously. He didn't publish it while he was alive. And that says a lot, I think. He uh, didn't want to have a direct confrontation. Well, I read in the Times he didn't want to have a direct confrontation because he wasn't physically capable of it at the end. Like, he didn't feel like he could physically handle having that We had an exchange, I don't know how many, many months before he passed away. And we sent email back and forth. Okay. So it's not as if he couldn't have. But look, I, I don't want to imply a motive for him because I don't know what was in his head. But uh, he, he, he made a kind of, he coined the word packet. He made the first switch, couldn't make a network out of it. But I was uh, very disturbed with the way he wrote that. But I decided not to make it a, uh, a battle because it was, he was passed away, it was not appropriate. And uh, yeah, he, he was mistaken the way he was, he was trying to assign the way I was thinking. And I know what I was thinking, I put it into my research. One thing that someone very wise mentioned to me, she said, you know, success has a thousand fathers. Do you feel like this early history of the ARPANET has come up with a thousand fathers? Yes, and I told you, there could, there could have been another thousand fathers. This was gonna happen. The idea of letting computers talk to each other on a dedicated data network was gonna happen. So I was speaking with Bob Metcalf, and he was saying how fond he is of you, but he said, you know, I think Len in some ways has overstepped the bounds of taking credit for some parts of this history. What do you say to that when he's saying, you know, how much he adores you, but he also thinks certain credit could be due <sighs> elsewhere? So when people were talking about packet switching and the networking, they equated it, they made the assumption that packet switching is the key to what makes the internet work. Okay. It's the technology that's being used. But as I said a moment ago, message switching is almost as good. There are some disadvantages, but the idea of dynamic resource sharing, the idea of not assigning a channel as the telephone company did to a conversation which is not using it, was the key idea to make efficient use. Packet switching is a good technology, but when people began to give credit for the internet, they credited the whole technology to Paul and some then to, uh, to Davies. Davies had relatively little to do with it, by the way. Paul has far greater development there. He wrote this very lovely series in 1964, a 14-volume series on data network and data communication, it was called. But there was no recognition that the mathematical modeling was important. And I argue that it is because on the basis of that, you can expand it. You can then go into wireless and other methods, and packet switching was one implementation. Uh, so I wanted to make clear that my work in the mathematical modeling, in fact, as I said, Larry used that modeling to justify his spending the money to make the opponent in the first place. So I did start saying, yes, my work was important. I don't know how, what Bob is referring to specifically, but you know, in some sense, yes, I probably said 
I was more important than I, I should have said. Um, I, 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 if enough people are saying that, then it's probably true. I left Len's office that day, understanding that one night in 1969, two computers talked to each other for the first time in history. Was it the start of the internet? Maybe. I'm not so sure. Yes, Len Kleinrock oversaw this first instance of a computer network. But does Len Kleinrock take too much credit for inventing the internet? Probably. Even Len admits now he takes too much credit. In all fairness, none of the founding fathers get as much credit as they deserve. Len Kleinrock may not like how much I pushed him on these questions, but Len is trying to preserve this history and make it just as important as the 1984 LA Olympics or the moon landing. After spending the past few months reporting out this story, I have to thank Len for being a fantastically charismatic showman who evangelizes and preserves this history like nobody else. He is the only one who even tried to keep this in and held on to it when he said the Smithsonian did not see its value in history. In the days that followed that interview, I have not been thinking about credit on packet switching. I left that interview thinking a lot more about legacy and how we all want to be remembered. When I asked my father about his legacy, He never takes credit for the ARPANET. He talks about the people he worked with on it. He talks about being remembered for the dollhouse he built me. He talks about being remembered by his grandchildren. But we know something fundamental that was worth fighting for credit happened in 1969. That is something to celebrate, which we will do in the next episode. Computer Freaks is a production of Inc., Created and hosted by myself, Christine Hani Dare Bryan. Our executive producer and editor is Josh Christensen. Associate producer is Sophie Codner. Music by James Jackman. Sound design and mixing by Nicholas Torres. Computer Freaks is dedicated to my dad, Major Joseph Hani. <laughs>